Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this um, Grand Challenges lecture. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is David Amigoni. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Enterprise here at Keele. Um, and just to send apologies on behalf of um, Professor Jonathan Wassling, um, Director of ILAS. He is away today and regrets that he can't be here. Um, Grand Challenges lectures are um, designed to be nothing if not um, contemporary and um, addressing the concerns of the moment and um, I think in light of uh, the events that followed uh, January the 27th and the, the, the ban of uh, migrant and refugee entry into the United States, um, the topic of today's um, lecture by Professor Alison Phipps of the University of Glasgow is very timely in Indeed. Um, the Institute for Liberal Arts and Sciences is, as true to its name, exploring um, the way in which the arts and the sciences contribute to our understanding of contemporary challenges today. And in introducing um, Alison Phipps, it's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce um, a colleague whose work from the perspective of humanities and the creative arts um, plays a very direct role in impacting and influencing the debate about um, hospitality um, in the face of the refugee um, challenge. So Alison Phipps is Professor of Languages and Intercultural um, Studies and co-convener of Glasgow's Refugee Asylum and Migration Network, that's Gramnet. Now from the 1st of January 2016, she was appointed to the UNESCO Chair in Refugee Integration through Languages uh, and the Arts. She's Distinguished Visiting Professor at the Waikato University, uh, New Zealand, uh, thinker in residence at the EU Hawke Centre. I think we'd all die to be a thinker in residence. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful title. Um, uh, University of South Australia and principal investigator for the two million uh, pounds AHRC large grant researching multilingually at the borders of language, the body, law and the state. In 2011, she was voted best college teacher um, by the student body and received the university's Teaching Excellence Award for a career distinguished by excellence. In 2012, she received an OBE for services to education and intercultural uh, interreligious relations in the Queen's Birthday Honours. She's also um, a fellow of the Royal Society um, of Edinburgh. So she's distinguished both for teaching uh, and for her research. She's undertaken work in, amongst others, Palestine, Sudan, um, New Zealand, Australia, Germany, France, USA, Portugal and Ghana. And she's produced and directed theatre and worked as a dramaturg and creative liturgist with the World Council of Churches um, from 2008 to 11 for the International Ecumenical Peace Convocation. Most recently, she co-directed co Broken World, Broken Word, um, a Naoam uh, African Dance Institute, um, Dodoa, Ghana, and Toana, uh, Toana Satoli uh, and uh, Gameli uh, Torzo, Todro. She regularly advises uh, public, governmental and third sector bodies on migration and language policy and she designed uh, and led a witness bearing visit to Calais for the Scottish members of the Home Affairs Select Committee. She's the author of numerous books and articles and a regular international keynote speaker and broadcaster and member of the Iona community. Her first collection of poetry, Through Wood, was published in 2009. The title of her Grand Challenges lecture this afternoon is Dying into Ta Dance, Taking Refuge, Talking Refuge and the Limits of Hospitality. Please join me in welcoming to Keel Professor Alison Phipps. Thank you so very much, David, for that very warm and full introduction. And when I hear that, I don't recognize myself. I'm also a little bit short-sighted. Um, I'm a baker and a gardener and a mother and a very ordinary person. Um, but it is really lovely to be back in Kiel and a, a place where I've had many friendships for a long time with uh, members of staff 
here, particularly at the moment, Mariangela Palladino, um, Awal Allo, who are two dear colleagues of mine who it's been a real delight to visit here on a, a number of occasions. Um, before I start, I'd just maybe like to make a couple of words of thanks to um, jo for all her running around and organising and Matt for sorting out things that aren't compatible from different parts of the world on IT and um, to Mark for driving and then also to um, Nadan Suotodjero who made this beautiful suit that I'm wearing um, which is an output of our researching multilingually project um, so it's rather nice to be wearing an output rather than having to just author an output um, I feel very privileged in that respect. You say gifts are in the feet. It's wartime. So shall I walk away? Shall I flee to the hills? Cross the seas, ford the river in spate? If I wear out my shoes, will the ache fade? Will the longing cease? Will I stand at last somewhere on the heart's edge? and sing again of love. I say, gifts are in the tears. I say, salt and water show what needs to flow. I say, stay with the river on your face, feet on the battleground. Gifts come from our grieving earth, watered with the longing in my eyes. In his later work, the philosopher Jacques Derrida looked at justice as something that was perhaps, he suggested, undeconstructible. And within that, he looked too at the idea of hospitality and the notion, the teasing notion, of what the limits of hospitality might be. And this is a quotation from him, and this is as tough theoretically as it's going to get, I hope. He said, it is, it is as though the laws, the laws, plural, not one law, but many, of hospitality, in marking limits, power, rights, and duties, consisted in challenging and transgressing the law of hospitality, the one that would command that the new arrival be offered an unconditional welcome. And for me, that's the terrain of what has been often named the refugee crisis, but to my mind is a political crisis around our politics and laws of hospitality. The way in which the law of hospitality, which demands an unconditional reception, comes up against our human limits, our questions, and our responses to human need and humans' requests for our hospitality. It frames um, with his dying work in many ways as a philosopher the questions into which we were to be plunged over the, la the last decade and particularly now and in ever increasing forms. So in terms of a grand challenge, I think Derrida offers it to us with his limits of hospitality. But it's important to remember that the challenge of the refugee and the challenge of hospitality is part of an epic story, a long story that has been with us for as long as certainly recorded human history can remember. The epic story of hospitality, which is always also the epic story of exile. And in that space, as Derrida tells us, in that space of the meeting of the exile with hospitality, that is where culture is made and unmade and made again anew. Culture is hospitality, says Derrida, and hospitality makes culture. And the epic story that we're in the middle of at the moment is an epic story of all kinds of tensions and contentions around the hardening of borders against kith and kin and the softening of the borders of the skin. The softening of the borders of the skin. This is what conditional hospitality <coughs> looks like as presently enacted on the frontiers of Europe. It's very easy for us to get distracted by the travel ban, contested travel ban, overturned travel ban, perhaps not overturned travel ban that we're watching um, in the dramas in the United States at present. But 
on our own borders in Europe and within our own borders in the UK. Many of those aspects of travel ban are, ban are already well enforced, just enforced in a different way um, through Frontex and obviously in the Mediterranean. We see the effects in different places on Lesbos and on, on Lampedusa and Malta and on around the shores of, of southern Europe and we see them in other places too. Um, before it was a crisis, whilst it was indeed a crisis for the people experiencing it, but it hadn't really come fully to the attention of any of us other than those of us very much with skin in the game. Um, back in 2011, um, there was the sinking of a boat where 480 Eritreans drowned just off Lampedusa. They were all seeking asylum from one of the world's most oppressive regimes. Um, and they were granted asylum, but only once they were in their coffins. So each of these coffins represents someone whose status was granted posthumously as a refugee. The hardening and softening of the borders of the skin. Where are your monuments, your battles, martyrs? In that grey vault, the sea, the sea, the sea has locked them up. The sea is history. So let me take you with me to two sites that I've been intimately involved with through the course of the work I've been doing for the last few years of the limits of our hospitality and the effects of the limits of our policies which are willed and held in place democratically and through voting um, of um, the limits of hospitality. So the first one, the place of taking refuge, um, the place of the borders between the UK and France. Um, is of course Calais and it's possible um, some of you have already visited the camps and been in the Calais camps which are reforming at the moment. Of course there was that moment where apparently they'd all been closed and um, about 12 um, asylum seekers were granted refuge if they had their dental work checked first in the UK. And um, But of course that camp has reformed. There are now many very dangerous camps along the borders um, with, with um, with the channel. Um, but this is, um, these scenes are taken from the um, work I did with the Scottish members of the Home Affairs and Justice Committee. Um, so with Joanna Cherry, Stuart MacDonald, um, Angela Crawley, and Anne McLaughlin, who are all elected representatives, with portfolios ra ranging from spokesperson on justice and home affairs to immigration and asylum and borders to civil liberties and women and children. And these were newly elected politicians who'd had no experience, really, of having other regular, on a regular basis asylum seekers showing up in their constituency surgeries saying, help. I am stuck. I am in danger. I am seeking refuge. I am coming to you to plead on my behalf to the Home Secretary for a role and a place and a movement on my case. Um, and they were really struggling. They'd never been to refugee camps. They'd never really experienced what it's like to be in those contexts. And asked myself and some of my colleagues to design something not that would be a photo opportunity for them to be seen in the media, but then for them to walk with us and with refugees and as asylum seekers and the NGOs working in those contexts, with the mayor of Calais and also of Grand Saint in that space, so that we could um, understand together over a period of a week, the week after Easter, of what those camps are like. So these are just a couple of images. You may recognize this as the, the church that was erected by Eritrean Orthodox Christians as um, a site for a place of sanctuary, a sanctuary within a refugee camp that is itself a sanctuary. So the creation of a place that is calm and peaceful um, that was later bulldozed. When we were in it, we could hear the bulldozers coming close that were already bulldozing the, the southern part of the camp. This is another image from the camp. Um, this is um, what we might, um, following a gamban, call a state of exception. So within the camp, camps, there were lots of um, quite quite folksy homemade shelters that had their own aesthetic and quirkiness. Some of them had window boxes with little flowers that people had planted. Some of them had stalls outside them with very beautifully ordered tomatoes and cucumbers and things that people could purchase as part of the black economy in the camps. But equally, the, the security state in France had decided that the camps needed um, a much more robust security state solution, as they called it themselves. So they set up these container camps um, where people sleep um, 14 to a container, um, children mixed in with the adults, mainly um, young men. 
um, which were inside um, security barred gates. And in those states of exception um, where people were housed, I think we see a really interesting paradox around our ideas and understandings of the limits of hospitality. So in those containers, you have the container, the symbol par excellence of globalization, of the free movement of goods under neoliberal capitalism, um, of the, the entry into ports. And these are places designed to keep human bodies seeking refuge in one place and under constant surveillance. So used for human bodies, for human material life in that sense, to root it in place and keep it in a particularly curtailed bordered zone. And yet inside containers which are usually used for the transfer of goods worldwide. The other thing perhaps to say about those is that these kinds of containers are the ones that are used by the Eritrean government to house prisoners of conscience um, and conscientious objectors um, who object to the national service and conscription. Um, and they're also places of torture and people will often be stacked 40 to 50 at a time inside those containers. So you can imagine that as an Eritrean asylum seeker or refugee in the Calais camps, you're going to resist being put in a container. You're not going to equate this with a place of safety. Over 2,000 years ago, Tacitus said, they create a wasteland and they call it peace. They create a wasteland and they call it peace. The second site where we might explore the limits of hospitality is the Islamic University of Gaza, which has been, um, over the last eight years, has been a partner working with me around um, trying to get online Arabic language teaching and online English language teaching off the ground, particularly for some of the 70% of graduates of the Islamic University of Gaza who end up unemployed and where a real concern of my colleagues, my academic colleagues, is that unemployment breeds discontent that leads to people um, being desperate enough to take up arms. So as really part of a peace building initiative, we've been working with our colleagues at the Islamic University of Gaza, and we've had one visit that I've been able to make um, uh, from before the war. And then our latest project began um, during the last aggression against um, the Gaza Strip. Um, which was just over two years ago now. Um, as part of the project that I've been leading, um, which is, um, has multiple partners in multiple contested sites around the world, um, where people experience the sharp end of conflict and therefore the large arrival numbers, nothing, we, we experience nothing in the UK compared to many of the places that um, receive asylum seekers and refugees and people fleeing persecution. But in a place, if we really want to think with the category and the understanding of the refugee, then Israel-Palestine is where we have to go. The State of Israel created four refugees for whom there was no other place to go because Europe was unable to offer sanctuary and was closing its doors. 
And yet, through that creation of a refuge, there was the creation of the new category of the refugee, the Palestinian refugee, the need for new agencies of UNHCR and of UNRWA to deal with over many years, and we're still seeing this conflict ongoing, with the question of return, with the question of the right of refugees in that place. A place where all the limits of hospitality worldwide are tested, a place which is still the testing point. And that testing point, yes, affects people directly on the ground, but it also comes into our lives and our rooms and this is what it was like doing this project in the middle of this question of where to go when there's nowhere to run to. So I'm sitting at my office and I receive the news from my colleague of what's been happening in Gaza. Uh, uh. Uh, uh. That was the Islamic University of Gaza and our project being blown up in a war. Um, probably the most extreme limit of hospitality and not one that we often experience as academics in the UK, but one which is increasingly part of work universities are having to think about how they do to support colleagues at risk. Um, our colleagues at risk in the Islamic University of Gaza can't leave. Um, there is nowhere to run to. It's impossible to leave the Strip. Um, and certainly it took us over 18 months even to be able to get our one co-investigator out to come and join us as part of project meetings. But despite that, there were still ways in which we could work. It wasn't the end of the story. There were still ways of working. We still were able to move. And the first sign of that was um, after being sent the image of the university blowing up. The next day came this image of one white rose left in the university garden which came as a message to me to say, Alison, we're still here, and we're still alive, and we're still beautiful. And the following day, a commitment to keep on with the work, which was written in sand on the beach in Gaza, and which was my name, very simply, my name. Since then, we have managed to train up our Arabic language teachers with a program of indigenous Palestinian related Arabic online learning and our first 25 teachers are currently teaching their first students of Arabic and they have employment. Um, and we've managed to do that by working across those limits of hospitality which are very real, which are technological and physical and material, but where there's still been a way thanks only to the tenacity of our partners and the will and determination of them to find something good that could grow again in that place of destruction and a way of making peace. So these are today's grand challenges, or today's grand challenge, and it's a tough one, and we're right in the middle of it, and we don't really know what to do. We're a bit lost. We don't have strong resources in our own contexts. But it is, for me, still the biggest question for our world, the one that George MacLeod characterised as being the biggest question for our world today, is how we share our bread. Not whether we share it, but how we share it, with bread there symbolising what we have to give as hospitality. It's not everything we're being asked to share and consider, but it's enough for the sustaining of human life. And our response so far, and we've seen it, um, has been a travel ban in multiple places. I was recently, as um, David was saying, I was recently in Australia and I landed as the travel ban on asylum seekers coming by boat was imposed on the country. And I, of course, was able to land very freely and easily with my UK passport and pass through because I'd landed by air. Um, and that travel ban equally being very much characterised in those borders around Europe. So a closing of the borders of the states and of regions, a building of higher walls, a sealing of the fate, which is for many a sentence to death. 
or to the barest life that Agamben talks about. A, 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 and as we've seen through the Palestinian struggle, what that looks like when people are characterised and only given a bare life to live. Many of our lessons around how to do this, that governments are learning, are being learned directly through the experience of imposing restriction in, in Palestine, but in, also in other areas of the world, and involve a lot of corporate response to that. But they also involve um, another set of... Um, controls within, so the, the borders that we're seeing the, against the taking of refuge, we're also seeing seeping through into the whole of our society and colleagues of mine in London have been doing a really wonderful project on everyday bordering, the way in which we're all border guards now, whether it be in healthcare or in education or in housing or employment or in banking, we have to prove who we are, we have to show our status, we have to sign contracts, we have to take and be people in public life who also do that work. That work has to be done with me in a context like this where I'm arriving and working with you. But it's also work I have to do for all my international students, as do all academics. I need to require them to tell me when they will be, where they will be, and bring along their identity documents. We're all border guards now. So there's no pure place to stand in this work. The limits of hospitality I may wish to give are ones which are curtailed by those laws that are brought in and that I have to stand up to. And I think for me it's been important to name that experience and again for me the place I go to when I do is into poetry. And they will say of me that despite it all I was an academic border guard that I assigned my signature to the papers which monitored and revealed the whereabouts of students from other lands whose learning was in my care. And they will have evidence when they look again, once again, at the only question we can ever have of history. How did this happen? How can human beings do this? They will say it of me and of you, my friends. And also of those who comply easily and don't question, as I do, as you do, daily. They will say it also of those who made the new rules gleefully, rejoicing in expulsions. Maybe they will look at my practices of resistance, but the weighing of evidence is rarely that subtle in such matters of life and death as implicate me now. Maybe... They will read the minutes of the Graduate Studies Committee of 2007, where we all said no. Maybe they will examine my chaotic filing system, my resistance to demands, the way I spoke to those I am to sign off. Maybe my accuracy will be found wanting, but I doubt it. That's probably not my way, even if I might wish it to be so. If justice comes quickly, hopefully, they will say it to my face. It will help with the healings, the clearing away of the detritus of the past. If there is forgiveness in that future, the one for which I work and pray, then perhaps, perhaps they will say it kindly and see that on balance, I was only doing my job. Those, of course, are the words that haunt me most. But if truth be told, my truth be told, every time I sign a form, I know my guilt and shame and believe that when the day comes and the question is asked and the just verdict falls for every form filled out and signed, you should spit in my face and if I am dead, desecrate my grave with my guilt. Someone's at the door, what's the fuss? Or would we really rather it was them than us? Of late, things are no worse than usual. Just the usual goings on. Down in the alleyway, the dog of poverty gives chase to the cat of democracy. Meow! Knocking over the rubbish bin of society, filled up with disposed weapons planted in the front lines. Sewers of memory filling up with discarded heroes of forgotten wars. Down on the continent, things are no worse than usual. Just the usual state. Guns and ammunition trade hands more than food and medication. New enemies made 
old friends forgotten, some pointing fingers, some pointing guns, some pointing fingers at those pointing guns, some pointing guns at those pointing fingers. Peace can't avoid a crisis, another memorial, another monument, secret organizations openly existing, pressure on privacy, just now, things are no worse than usual. Just the usual regression. Down in the city, it's an ever-changing skyline. Skyscrapers of ego race towards the clouds. New ways of localization, they call it globalization. And there's so much to take in. Megabytes, gigabytes, kilobytes. And then there's so much to take in. Junk mail, junk food, and just plain junk. And yet, there's still so much more to take in. Skeletons short of closets lie uncovered in magazine covers. And yet, there's still so much to take in. Down at the movies, the new blockbuster, God, the sequel, played by a powerful actor, now available in cinemas, somewhere in the evening. Someone's at the door. What's the fuss? Or would we rather it was them than us? So where to go? And to whom to think again and anew the questions we are posed by all those asking where to when no one will have us. The text that I find myself meditating with pretty much every week at the moment is Hannah Arendt's extraordinary short essay, We Refugees, which she wrote in 1943 as a refugee from Nazi Germany in the United States. And at the very end of that piece, she says um, this, she says, the concomity of the European peoples went to pieces when and because it allowed its weakest member to be excluded and persecuted. So she looks back to that other moment in history when Europe disintegrated um, within more recent times and sees the way in which nation states had to be entirely reconfigured with their borders in different places, but also that the kind of moral compact of Europe also fell to pieces. It was found to be wanting, to not be sufficient to take people in. And of course, in the context of the Brexit vote and the context of the questions around the precarity and the rise of the far right in Europe, we again are witnessing a Europe that is falling to pieces and whose moral place as a Nobel Prize winner of 60 years of peace is suddenly being sorely tested. But she's also quite optimistic in that work. She's optimistic in that work because she's optimistic about our possibility of learning from our common role as refugees because it's we refugees she speaks of, and she sees that as being a common basis for all of humanity. Um, and is really testing, and Agamben talks with her in a later essay about this, about the way in which the idea of rights and sovereignty and citizenship is tested by the category of the refugee, a prior category, that rights and citizenship aren't going to be sufficient to get us to a place where we can address our limits of hospitality. She says, apparently nobody wants to know that contemporary history has created a new kind of human being, the kind that are put in concentration camps by their foes and internment camps by their friends. And of course, when I read that sentence, I think of those containers in the Calais camps. They're the internment camps that the friends are producing. History repeats itself. She also talks about the refugee, as does Agamben, as sacred in the original sense of the Latin word, of, of being destined to die, of knowing something about death that those of us who do not live daily in that Thanatos moment, in that moment of death, don't and can't understand. 
Um, but she, and she, she says that refugees driven from country to country then represent the vanguard of their peoples if they keep their identity, if they keep that sense of what it means to live in and dwell in exile. And it's from that that Europe remade itself. It's certainly from that that Germany, the site of many of my studies over the last years, um, remade itself as over a third of the population was displaced after the Second World War. So displaced peoples and the, the tension and the confluence of ideas and peoples and languages and cultures coming together for a mutual reintegration and making of a society, but driven from that experience of the refugee. It's not what our dominant scripts tell us. They don't tell us the answer is held in the body of the refugee and the stories told by refugees. What our dominant scripts are telling us is our dominant scripts of therapeutic, technocratic, consumer militarism. What they tell us is that it's rights and citizenship at the best, that sovereignty matters, that it's a hardening of the borders. And yet, at the same time, as we see those coffins lined up, then, as Walter Brueggemann says, that script that socializes us all has failed. It can't make us safe, and it can't make us happy. It can't make us safe, he says, and it can't make us happy. And what he, together with Arendt, subscribed to is the idea of the counter story, the alternative story, the one that's hidden and sitting amongst us, but maybe we can't quite see like the voice of a song coming from the back of a room. It's the offer of a counter story because, as Brueggemann says, people don't change and change much any longer by sheer cognitive appeal or doctrine, by telling people how things are. They may have done in the past, but that's not how people change any longer. And people don't change much because of moral appeal, telling people what's right and what the moral ground is they should stand on, or at least not these days. And certainly there's a huge amount of moral appeal going on from the refugees' welcome movements across Europe and across the world, but it's, it's not changing much in, in terms of those limits of hospitality inscribed in laws. What Brueggemann says is that we change through the offer of other models, old stories half forgotten, echoes from other people, other places, other tracings, through the invitation into a different way of living and modeling a life that is part of a counter story. The image there um, was done by one of my colleagues in Gaza, um, during the war as the bombs were falling and he would send me different images every day and that was his image, his offer of a counter story. Um, we know from the lovely title of that famous book that the impossible will take a little while. And Brueggemann says that the new world is not given whole any more than the new self is given abruptly in psychotherapy. It's given only a little at a time. One act, one healing, one poem, one pronouncement, one promise, one commandment at a time. It's not given overnight. There are no easy solutions. It's a life lived as we refugees. Within the work that we've been doing in our larger project, we've been trying to take that idea of the counter story very seriously across a range of projects with a range of questions about what that might mean for us in terms of how we research, how we work, how we change the dominant scripts, how we live out a counter story. And looking at it particularly in my own disciplines of intercultural studies and modern languages with refugees, um, looking at what happens to our expressive capabilities under pain and pressure, but also how we as academics might grow and widen our research methodologies to be able to encompass the experience of being refugees and being with refugees. How we might break with what are often um, extractivist methodologies. We go in, we mine the terrain, we dig out the data, we pull it back, we analyze it and subject it to considerable pressure back in our offices and that's kind of how we do the research. What might it look like if we change that and if we acknowledge the much wider base out of which we do our work, working alongside artists and other the linguists. So in the work that we've been doing, this is the more optimistic part of the talk, by the way, if this is all feeling a bit unremittingly miserable. Um, we worked with a whole bunch of artists who don't normally get to be artists, including my wonderful colleague Tawana, who's travelled with me to be here with us today, um, to um, just incorporate poetry and song and dance and a making together of new forms 
that escape the deficit models, the deficit models which say it, you've got to learn English and the biggest problem with refugee integration is your English. Not the biggest problem with refugee English is that we live in a country that really only speaks English. Um, and certainly our systems of education are set up like that. We're lucky in Scotland we've got Gaelic and we've got sign language and we've got Scots now as part of a plural um, multilingual country under the devolved powers. But we've still got a deficit model that we impose on people, a burden we expect people to move towards. When actually what we're living with, with the resources in the bodies of people who arrive, is language plenty. Language in plenty, more than enough, an extraordinary abundance that can actually bring, yes, maybe transactional competence and clarity in certain areas of law and, 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 and other work, but actually can also be part of that hospitality of culture, of remaking our language in just the same ways that at other times of great movement and travel, I'm thinking of Shakespeare, our language changed and changed and was shaped greatly. So the work we've been doing, we've been doing um, off this large multi-million pound grant with findings from all over the world. We've had artists working alongside our researchers, listening in and generating thematic elements of that epic story of exile of, and, and of the broken world and of the broken word that we bring together. And what the AHRC thought we would do was put on a performance at, I don't know, the National Theatre in London or in Paris or New York as part of the high impact work. And what we said we wanted to do was shift that narrative a little, not keep the control here, but actually take it to a small township in the Dangme region, Dangme speaking region of Ghana, in, going towards the Volta region outside Accra, and work with young displaced people, young people, um, people who live largely on a dollar a day, and say, look, these are our themes and our research questions. How would you dance it? What does that mean if you translate it? into a form for yourselves. And so I spent the whole of the month of September with Tawana, my colleague, and two other colleagues, Gamali um, Todro and Nadensua Todro, responsible for the jacket, um, working to co-direct and co-produce a performance with the young people. Um, living together quite communally, cooking together, creating together, eating together, working together, to produce a piece we called Broken World, Broken Word. And these are just a couple of images from this. Um, to do that, we had to set up a little microfinance initiative with some of the women to bring back the skills of batik and um, tie-dye making so that we could have a set design that was made um, within that context. So you can see some images here of some of the mothers of some of our cast getting a little employment out of this cultural project we were involved in. Um, and we worked with a, a choreographer as well from the National Theatre of, of Ghana to do this work. So I'm just going to show you a little bit about what I think our aunt meant when she talks about we refugees and about what it means to die and to dance and to live again. So this is what we made. This is the first night of our performance and it's an extract from our production. <laughs> And there she is, um, 
dying into dance, as W.B. Yeats says. Um, how can you tell the dancer from the dance? Um, so that gives you just a little taster of the, the energy. We're hoping to bring the performance over here to bring all the young people over for the Solas Festival, which is kind of a combination of WOMAD meets Greenbelt up in Scotland um, in June. Um, home office permitting, we're at the point of filling in the forms to get the visas. Um, so wish me luck with that one. Um, but maybe just before we finish, um, a couple of things to say about the making of it, because um, it was a learning, and it meant that as a principal investigator of a multi-million pound grant with responsibilities to you, the public, who pay the taxes that allows us to do this kind of research, I had to do a fair amount of undoing of my normal ways of working. So yes, to regularly report, but also to be able to work in different ways with trusted colleagues in a different context. Um, we started to talk about what we did as working with a calabash. We worked with a calabash um, to generate the work. We danced with a calabash every day. We did our consent into a calabash every day. Many of the young people couldn't read or write, or certainly not English, and so signing consent forms was never going to happen. Um, and we used this to be symbolic and generative of these ideas of plenty and abundance. Um, not to do documentary realism, but to tell the story of the drownings in the Mediterranean, of the siege of Gaza, which comes up with that gesture um, within the dance piece, of what it's like to lose people and to mourn, but also to celebrate coming together again and making a new life. We saw the calabash as a symbol of the land and the language and the culture lost but also of the way that in that loss it's often broken and shared and that pieces of it take up form and life in new cultures and new places because it's able to create entanglements. We used it to devise with, we used it as a ceremonial ritual, even a fetish object. And in the performance for the first time in the theatre in the, in the bush, the local community were able to come and watch people. Often these dancers might go to the city to do that work, but we actually had this without any charge, no fee-paying strangers for the whole community to come and celebrate and experience this translation they'd made of our work. Um, we asked them how they would translate it, and we looked at working with methods that embody the principles of conflict transformation um, in everyday society, but with young people, adolescent young people who are as all young people the world over, as capable as anyone else of ganging up and bullying and falling out and um, all of those elements of their work. And importantly for the project on researching multilingually, we put English last. So this was where much of my control had to be given up. Um, we worked in 20 languages, many of the indigenous languages, local language in Twi and Ga and Akan and Ewe, um, and also in Dangme, which when I started the project was a language I did not even know existed in the world. And then the other languages of the orchestral musicians who came together and composed music <laughs> to fit the piece, who were from Burkina Faso and from Ghana and from Spain and from um, the UK and from Denmark. Um, and we often didn't have a shared language. Um, we had to work through and together with gesture and English came last. And it was a bit of a joke with the cast that at the end of a 20 language simultaneous translation around what we were going to do next, they would ask me then to do the final act in English of saying what I thought everyone had been saying. And sometimes I got it right and often I got it wrong. So for us, the calabash in the dance piece represented the centre of what we were doing, but also the limits that we could find that we were always expanding and extending to the point where the calabash breaks within the production. And we have a film of this about to go live in the next six weeks, so I'll make sure that you guys down here get a link to it and also to the documentary that we've made about the making of this work. The calabash changed the space. It became a symbol a little of the refugees, of something that's been a bit forgotten and hidden and on the margins. It's quite hard to get calabash in parts of Ghana and Zimbabwe where we've hunted for them high and low. And yet this used to be a regular symbol of life. You drink from it in Nigeria, you wear it on your head as if it's a motorcycle helmet. Um, and we use this as a devising piece within our work to change our space, but also to change us and to give away at the end. Before I finish, um, I think, and this is really a postscript to what I want to say, all of this work is work done in a professional setting. But for me, sitting with and living with these questions has also meant that, in the words of the poet Rilke, 
I too have had to change my life. I've looked at the evidence and I have needed to come to new ways of living. Du musst dein Leben enden, is what Rilke says. And Irigaray says that sharing the world, the world we're in, meeting a stranger outside our own boundaries is rather easy in those professional contexts when we can go home and nothing's changed and we can just appropriate between ourselves in a safe way within our limits what we've discovered. But to be forced to limit and change our home or our way of being at home is much more difficult. And in the context of that philosophical thinking, um, about eight years ago as a decision based on research evidence, my husband and myself took the decision to start living with destitute asylum seekers um, and have done so ever since. One of those asylum seekers who came to live with us later became our foster daughter. She spent time in the detention estate of the UK. Um, she was separated from her family for over five years. They thought she was dead. We have gone through all of that living as refugees with her in our family and our lives. All the joy of her getting refugee status, of discovering her family is still alive, of being able to travel to a, th a third country where we can meet her family, her mother, her brothers and sisters, but also all the agony of waiting for someone to make a decision about her limits to hospitality, her right to remain, um, even her right to remain indefinitely with us as her new family. Judith Butler says that revolution happens because everyone refuses to go home. In her thinking about what mass protest actually represents in society today, she sees it as a place where people quite quirkily take the language of the home onto the streets. And certainly we've seen that with the language of the home of Scots in Scotland being on all of the placards in the anti-travel de ban demonstrations, of people are making things in quite artisanal ways that I'm refusing to go home, refusing to be domesticated in their politics as a way of working. So I refuse to go home, but I re also refuse to say that this, this time, this time is an easy place to stand. When you share the skin color that I have, or when you speak the language I speak, and when you come from the history, that whether I like it or not, and despite all my efforts, will stick to me like glue. My name is Alison, and I am a recovering racist. But I was born with this addiction because my ancestors were white, and the country I'm from grew fat in every imperial fight. Money, privilege, and power come down the barrel of a gun that wasn't just in history. It's still how this is done. The work which calls me loudly towards your skins and eyes and tears is the work which is intention to assuage those birthright fears. So do not idolize my actions. Do not praise my words as bold. Do not look at the donations or the papers that I hold. The thoughts I have of charity are just part of that addiction inherited from a line that is a long and bleached out fiction. I do not have to worry when my skin is in a room or on a train or in a car or in the immigration tomb because my ancestors were slave owners or slave drivers and right. I will be given space and money and more time because I'm white, while you, my friends, my kindred, will be skinned another way, flayed into diminishments through ever greater punishments and all those cruel admonishments, the only proper meaning of a white man's burden is that for all my days, commitment will be to a healing labor. On my deathbed, in my dying, I will be a racist too, but it's shouldering of the burden that can lead to something new, something, not denial of what sticks to every tone or shade or pore, but the making of relationships that brim with something more, something giving and forgiving of the shame upon my skin, something real and raw and honest that can live with history's sin. At times, our conversations will make our skin dissolve. And around us through the laughter, a new world may revolve when the tears are all that join us and the skin gives way to bone. And through the pain, we'll love again and call this earth our home.
There is no one to check you in. Or check you out. There is no one to weigh your baggage or touch you up. No hands above head, eyes down, feet behind the line. There is no unheard of, heard of people. No super scanners scanning for super diseases. No super receptors or interceptors. No pass, no gate, no board, no number. There is no priority clearance. No catwalk for the privileged, first class. There is no dignity stripping interview, those paper cuts. No very, 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 very verification of identity. There is no Iwenduan. Oh no, baby. When the pi. In fact, there is only us and the trees and elephant grass. For in a manner of speaking, in a matter of seconds, we are across the frontier, border crossing in Togo. Thank you.